Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Clark. I'm the Assistant General Secretary at the Trade Union Community. Um, we are one of the sponsors of today's event. Um, communities are a, a relatively small union, um, private sector, um, a lot of traditional membership, but a, a growing interest in a growing membership in and around self employed and freelance workers. Uh, most of our members are, are in the private sector. Um, and most recently we've been involved in the, the campaign around the steel industry, so uh, quite a topical campaign. Okay, so here on my left we've got um, Mags Buhas. Mags will say a lot about what she's been doing over the over the last few months in the campaign with the International Workers of Great Britain. We've got Jonathan Katona as well, uh, you're the Vice President, and I want to start off after me to say a bit about the work that uh, they've been undertaking um, as well. And We've got Sarah Gledon. Sarah is from SMART. Uh, you might have heard SMART mentioned uh, a couple of times in sessions already today. Essentially, a corporate that's providing services and representation to uh, workers uh, across Europe, but also across Europe as well. Uh, and as I said, my name is John Pack, I'm the Assistant General Secretary of the Community. Uh, and I wanted to just say a little bit about the work that we've been doing in this area, uh, particularly. Uh, the work that we're doing with a co-working cooperative called Indicube, who originated in Wales. And the interesting thing about that is um, where a lot of our traditional members are in the steel industry. Indicube, over the last five or so years, um, have uh, developed around about 30 co-working spaces. They were a social enterprise, recently become a cooperative. Uh, and they're providing a, a really um, valuable resource for people who traditionally haven't been uh, self-employed and freelance uh, and might have been working out of their own kitchen or their back room or whatever, um, but creating communities in redundant retail space and redundant office space for people to come and work. So essentially it's an online platform where you can go and go into that and you know, book your, book your uh, desk for a day, book it for a week, book it for a month. Uh, we've been speaking to, to Indicube for about the last year now, but Mark Cooper here who's the founder of Indicube and we just agreed recently to take a, a stake in that corporate to provide a range of services um, for the people who are in Indicube, but also to help Indicube expand from the, the 30 or so spaces that you have just now to 1,200 right across the UK. Recognising that um, there are a group of, of workers there who traditionally may have went into um, the traditional forms of employment where trade unions have been organised and benefit from the, the communities and the workplace environment that, uh, that you know, traditional workplaces have um, and trying to replicate that in, in these new co-working spaces and not just co-working spaces, looking at uh, co-making spaces and other developments that could allow people to work independently um, and uh, make sure that as a community that we could you know, deliver a range of services. So as I said, that's a, a five-year uh, programme. Uh, it's the first of its kind in the UK. I think we've heard a lot about potential trade union corporate partnerships. We think this will be an exciting trade union corporate partnership, and hopefully it will lead to more trade unions and corporates working more effectively together. Because I think if we are going to support people in this changing economy and the speed of change that we're facing this economy, I think the corporate movement and trade union movement will be working more effectively together. Uh, in, in around all this community are taking a real interest in the, the issues that are affecting freelance and self-employed workers directly. So that's looking at the kinds of benefits and services that, that we can give them, probably more importantly, identifying the campaigns that are important to freelance and, and uh, self-employed workers. But secondly, um, also looking at the uh, the, um, this, what the welfare of the state can do for them, what, what the government can do, the policy changes that we're going to need to support workers in these situations, the legal changes, I'm sure that um, our colleagues here will say more about that um, during the discussion. But it's quite clear that the, what people have taken for granted previously in the traditional workplace and the, the traditional economy isn't fit for purpose going forward, so we need to try and build to ensure that the benefits that uh, people pay for granted in terms of maternity pay and time off for paternity leave, things like that, are all addressed as, uh, as um, uh, you know, we have more and more people becoming independent workers and becoming self employed and freelancers. So it's a, a huge policy area, 
we're engaged as a union in, in that policy area, as we are in many of the other areas where we represent people. Um, and I think it's really important that we that we have a trade union voice um, in the room on that. Um, and I, 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 if we're being honest, um, we, we don't have a, a government just now who are <coughs> keen on, on having a, a constructive dialogue with trade unions. Um, but I think we need to be making our case not just for the government, but other like-minded organisations so our voice can get stronger on these issues. So I've had a strange experience of um, being a panellist and chairing um, the, the, this session. Um, I'm always conscious that I might speak too long, so I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to hand over to the other uh, people that we have at the top table there so we can see a bit more about what they've been doing. Um, we'll go through everyone one by one, if everyone can introduce themselves and say a little bit more. Um, about their own background for those that are just joining us. Uh, and then, as I said, we'll open up the questions, comments, and, uh, and hopefully we'll have a really good and interesting discussion. John. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, my name is Jonathan Katana. I'm the Vice President of the Independent Workers Union of Great Britain. Uh, we're also a small um, independent union. We're independent of the TUC, which is the Trade Union of Congress. Um, and I'm going to speak a bit about what we think are the challenges and the opportunities for unions for working with co-ops um, in the changing world of work, which is a, is a bit of a label, and I hope I'll go clarify that a bit. Um, we're more powerful together, and that's a principle on which unions were founded in the first place that's still relevant today. And it's especially true if you're a worker in a precarious job. Um, and it's also true in a market where individualism or independence is also supposed to be a benefit to somebody. Um, I'm speaking about the gig economy. Um, so the role of unions has always, has traditionally been an organized pushback against the greed of profit-driven corporations or the bill hook of unscrupulous free market forces. Um, and that equates to the same thing for low-wage workers, which is just making it more difficult to tread water. Uh, through the collective action of unions in the past, we've won a lot of things that we take for granted today, which is maternity and paternity pay, uh, non-discrimination non rights, rest breaks, two-day weekend, paid annual leave, maximum hours and minimum wages, and a lot more. Um, but today, technology has changed the game a lot. Um, it affords us a lot of it, uh, an interface in which we can enhance our own potential as individuals. We can find work better, we can do work better, we can communicate and collaborate um, and have a farther reaching impact. Um, and in light of that, that changing circumstances, the unionism that I spoke about seems a bit historical. Um, but it's really just opened up a new front where the traditional struggle still continues. Um, before I put a label on the new situation, let me describe the conditions. Precarity and fluctuation of work, a void of regulation, a disparity of bargaining power between employers and workers, workers without rights or protections, they're vulnerable against being discriminated against, sacked or replaced without notice. I might be describing the work the world of work in Victorian London, but I'm describing a rapidly growing trend in modern work, and that is in the gig economy. Um, so there's been a recent string of court cases um, against the likes of Uber, City Sprint, Pimlico Plumbers. Um, these are companies which claim to operate on a gig or platform structure. Um, these companies were found in court to have been illegally depriving their workers of rights. The courts didn't invent any new laws um, for these rulings. They simply enforced existing employment law. Um, so these people were found by the courts to be called so-called workers, which is a legal type of employment status, um, which the Supreme Court says is a type of self-employed person for tax purposes, but someone who still do some employment rights, not all, but some employment rights, because they carry out their work as part of someone else's business. So they're not doing their work uh, as an entrepreneur and they're not answering only to themselves, but they're working on behalf of someone else. Um, so the court rulings determined that these and potentially other companies were not platforms at all, but traditional employers masquerading as such and uh, thus depriving their workers' rights. 
So how does this happen in modern society today? Um, the lack of rights is reminiscent of the past, but the difference is today we're combating the spins placed upon these familiar conditions, um, which are being masked essentially by new technology, um, by companies such as Uber, um, which claims it's not a transportation company, um, or a courier company like City Sprint, which has a fleet of 3,000 vehicles, but it claims not to employ a single courier. Um, it seems counterintuitive, but delivery riders, Uber drivers, and the like are forced to sign take it or leave it contra uh, contracts, um, stating that they are financially independent individuals um, and that they're acting alone and essentially competing with other gig uh, workers for jobs. Uh, this is supposed to be a good thing because it enables people to work flexibly, to be able to pick and choose jobs that suit them. Um, the idea is reinforced in the contract that uh, they occasionally do one-off jobs here and there, but they're under no obligations to complete more or to be given more. Um, the reality of that is that there's a great percentage of them who work consistently as employees and rely on that as their main source of income. So the job isn't as flexible as advertised, um, and the bargaining power of the workers is so offset and minimized by the employer's ability to exploit these conditions that the benefits of casual work arrangements are really muted. Um, so the IWGB feels that larger unions have been slow to wake up to that fact. Um, uh, but the future of unions in relation to casual work is that unions are more relevant than ever. Um, we shouldn't be resisting the changing working of work, but we should be wary of the encroachment of uh, deregulation that can basically creep, creep under the under the cover of terms like flexibility and decentralization. Um, so unions have to be visual, vigilant to make sure corporations uh, aren't exploiting people in new ways, or rather old ways, but with new technology and under new labels. So the IWGB can be a good example of how unions are reacting. Um, food delivery drivers with the IWGB are launching a profile, high profile campaign in Brighton uh, for higher pay in conjunction with taking delivery to court uh, to claim one of the rights due to workers, and that's the right to collective bargaining um, through trade union recognition. Um, so actions such as this are an example of how unions remain relevant to the gig and platform sectors. Um, these workers felt, felt powerless to change their conditions until they unionized and started acting as a collective. Um, so co-op progression of the kind discussed here today must learn to distinguish itself clearly from those masqueraders who are exploiting alternative approaches to work. Um, so I think a key to this is ensuring the ownership, the profits, and the control of the co-op remains with those who do the work. Um, and if a situation arises when a platform begins to act like an employer, then the platform it really ceases to distinguish itself from a contractor-style business model. So unions and co-ops can uh, work together to uh, preserve established working rights as well as the benefits of casual work for the workers rather than uh, for companies. So we spring from the same principle of grassroots organization and I think we can continue to work as such. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, Sarah, can you just introduce yourself because a few people have come in and my head. <coughs> give your comments, please. Thank you. Um, so my name is Sarah. I work as a, a project manager by Smart, uh, which is a badging cooperative. I'm gonna explain uh, now what is Smart and what we do, and then I jump into the career topic um, later on. Um, so Smart is a badging cooperative that uh, was created in 1996. <laughs> And uh, since its creation, uh, there have, has been 75,000 people using uh, its services. Uh, so we are a shared company uh, that allows autonomous workers uh, to work in a safe and legal environment. They can develop their uh, project, professional project and activity uh, within uh, this, um, this uh, cooperative. Uh, but the essence of the project is that all our members are salaried worker of the cooperative, okay? Um, but they maintain at the same time their autonomy. 
so originally we were working with artists uh, that needed to declare their gigs. Um, so due to the intermittent nature of their works, their work, um, many of them couldn't uh, recognize, uh, couldn't fit into the classical categories of, uh, of uh, social statuses in, in Belgium. Uh, being um, self-employed, uh, there are heavy charges that uh, um, and, and costs uh, inherent to this status uh, that uh, they couldn't uh, bear because uh, of their because they couldn't um, guarantee enough steady revenues. Uh, but of course, salaried workers—it's quite a rare thing to see now nowadays an artist working for the same employer uh, for many many years. Um, and civil servant is even a, a rare thing. Okay, as an artist. So, as such, uh, SMART started uh, offering short-term and fixed-term contracts to those people uh, that allowed them to use the revenues um, they made during their gigs uh, and transform that into a salary and, um, and build their social rights through that. <coughs> so eventually we started expanding the, our field of action to um, workers that had actually the same working reality, um, being um, flexibility, uh, project-based work, um, intermittent uh, work, uh, irregularity of income, uh, multiplicity of clients. Um, so based on the principle of mutualization, uh, we uh, provide uh, those members some administrative and legal uh, support, uh, but also insurance, working insurance, um, uh, series of financial tools, uh, and this is very important for the rest of my presentation. We uh, include a payment guarantee fund, uh, which guarantees that the, the worker will be paid within seven working days, uh, uh, and no matter when the, the, the payment date line of the, the, the client is, or whether the client pays this bill or not. Um, so. Uh, there, is all, there are also microfinancing services and so on, and a debt recollection service. So along the way, Smart starting developing an online platform that allows um, workers, with more of an online tool that allows them to uh, benefit from a um, simplified accounting tool. Uh, we have um, that allows them to, to, to remain autonomous as much as they can, as they can. Um, we have developed different IT tools as well to reduce certain uh, administrative charges and, and to, to, to be able to reach the scale that we have today. Um, so our model is that uh, our members are autonomous workers, um, so they manage their professional activities, so they negotiate with their clients, they fix their price, uh, they um, agree on what to do and so on with their clients, uh, then they give us that information uh, saying, okay, I'm going to work those days for that project to, and I want to build that much to that client. Um, so we send the invoice on their behalf and then um, convert, we, we make all the legal declarations and so on and convert the, what remains uh, uh, into a letter salary. Um, so we finance our services our services by uh, the smart deducts 6.5% of the amount that is invoiced um, to the clients. Uh, this fee covers our operational costs, but the surplus is re-injected uh, into the mutualized services. Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the digital platforms and the, the gig economy and the on-demand platforms um, that we are working on right now. Uh, so in 2013, one of our members that was using our services to, as, a, as an artist to, to declare his, uh, uh, his work as a, as a graphic designer uh, wanted to work as well for a platform that was called Take It Easy uh, and um, so quite naturally, of course, because those platforms are only working with the, um, independent workers and freelance workers, uh, he decided to use our service to build his shifts to the platform. Um, in the following months, we saw a slow but constant progression in the number of um, careers. So, um, in 2015, in March 2015, there were 89 careers, 
registered. A year later, in March 2016, there were 434 couriers um, using our services. And this was also due to the arrival of uh, Deliveroo on the Belgian market. Um, so we started to grow some major concerns about uh, their working conditions and wages condition. Um, so indeed, couriers were paid per delivery, but they were also depending on an algorithm to get their uh, shift assignments. This is called priority booking, and uh, so it's the best couriers get rewarded by having the priority of the next shift. Um, so of course, besides fostering aggressive competition between couriers, uh, uh, encouraging risk, taking risks, it also um, left many careers with no shifts uh, and no, no income, although they were actually working. Um, so while we normally leave uh, it to the, to the members to handle their relation to their, with their clients, we, um, we decided to step in and to assume the role of the employer that we actually legally were and uh, started to, to negotiate with the, with the platforms. And in, uh, in June 2016, uh, Take It Easy and Deliveroo signed a convention uh, with the SMART to, um, to assure the, the following points. So we, uh, this, the convention is, has those following points, uh, the payment of minimum three hours per day, no matter uh, whether the, the career gets shifts or not, he will get three hours paid, he or she will get three hours paid. Um, the hourly wage, uh, wage will be built 15.4 euros, which is 9.31 euro brutto, which is around seven netto. Okay. Uh, euros. Sorry, I, don't, I didn't make the conversion. In, in it will change by the end of the meeting. The convention also says that uh, Deliveroo will. Um, uh, include a defrayal for the use of their personal bikes and phone. And uh, we uh, encourage safety trainings uh, for the bikers before their first shifts, and as well as regular technical um, um, checks of their, of their bikes. Um, well, in, in the morning of uh, July 2016, the 26th, 2016, we read in the newspaper that Take It Easy uh, had filed for bankruptcy, the fight for bankruptcy. Um, so this, the platform who has been, which was present in, in 20 cities around Europe, in France, Belgium, Spain, and England, um, left thousands of self-employed workers, careers, uh, self-employed uh, auto-entrepreneurs uh, with uh, no uh, capacity to, to claim for the payment of their shifts of June. And July. So, um, as I said earlier, uh, Smart is a solution for the members not to um, to carry alone the weight of their commercial the commercial risks of their activity. Um, and our 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 salary guarantee fund came into operation, and Smart took charge um, of uh, the, the salary of around fifty of. Uh, 500 couriers for, um, for an overall amount of uh, 340,000 euros. Uh, so this shows the, the, that those solutions are uh, necessary for uh, in, in this kind of situation, in this kind of uh, um, uh, new, new, new workers uh, model. Um, so now today, uh, Smart has developed some security invoicing with those platforms, of course, to to avoid the similar situations. Uh, in January, we're at uh, 2,000 careers working for uh, through Smart uh, for Deliveroo. Around nine, 900 of them work uh, on a monthly basis. Um, there is still a lot to do, um, okay? But we keep on working on prevention, on safety actions. Uh, addressed to those uh, food, truck, uh, food tech workers. But uh, being able to, to accompany those uh, digital transition by offering pragmatic solutions is um, one of our main goal. But um, we can try to regulate as much as we want uh, or as much as we can 
uh, this disruptive sector, uh, I think it has to be uh, incorporated into a um, more global debate about how we as consumer uh, can um, foster or, or counter the appearance of uh, services that um, promote low-cost uh, services instead of uh, decent working conditions or, or basic social rights. So it is essential to foster collaboration with the various stakeholders, um, maybe the state or, or in terms of labor market intermediaries like us, or uh, unions and careers and so. Thank you. Thank you. That was first class, thank you. Right, so, um, thank you, Ross. I'm going to hand over to Max, she's going to tell us about uh, the case that she took against City Sprint and where that's been. Max, you might give a bit of background on yourself for the people that have been. Um, yeah, I'm, I feel a bit out of uh, the odd one out here because I was asked to talk about a legal case that um, we just won against my employer. Um, so it's not very cooperative. <laughs> 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 I mean, it, it was in the spirit of cooperation. We had some lovely lawyers do it all for me. Um, so <laughs> don't really know what to say. Um, Can you just got, keep your time? Uh, my, my name's Mags and I'm a courier. I'm a bike courier for oh, City right. Sprint. Some of you may know City Sprint, had of them used them. They are the UK's leading same-day delivery company. They have, as John said, about three or three and a half thousand couriers on, not on their books. <laughs> uh, you know, self-employed couriers. Um, and I think that, that, just to kind of reiterate a little bit what John said, I think it's really um, important that people like myself or anyone in the gig economy who finds themselves on what you if you think your contract is bogus it probably is so you know if you're if you're signing something that says you're an independent contractor and you are under no obligation to do any work and we're under no obligation to give you any work and um if you want to take us to a court or to tribunal you're gonna have to pay our legal fees and all these sorts of intimidating clauses that are in these very, very lawyered contracts. Just a heads up, if you are signing one, probably, uh, in all likelihood, it's rubbish and you should take them to court over it. And um, I was very terrified about it, partly because of that clause that says you should indemnify us of the legal costs. Um, but also it's a very like, exposing scary process for people to go through and um, I don't know anyone that's been to a tribunal, don't know what the process is like, you know, completely alien to me. So it was really good to have a good legal team in the union to support me doing it. But um, I just think that there are like a growing number of people who are finding themselves on these contracts and the more people that take their company to court over these issues the more of a deterrent that is. It's like the collective action, that what do you call it? Like the latent energy from everyone's actions will come together and the companies will be more and more scared of being the next company in the newspapers for this issue, which is 100% exploitation. It's not, um, and there's not anything good about it. <laughs> you know, it is, it is uh, a sham. And that's what the judge said. That's not my word. So uh, I think um, interesting for me and uh, colleagues from the IWGB to come and hear about COPS because it's been something that has been we've been thinking about um, over the couple of years that we've been doing this, um, but we've never actually started anything. Um, it would be great if uh, we could. And hearing about SMART actually is super inspirational because I think there's, uh, depending on the different uh, legal situation in each country, the different legal framework. So in the UK, you know, it's very easy to be self-employed, um, hard to unionize. We need to use whatever um, tools we have at our disposal to, to, to win the best situation for, um, for the workers and uh, I'd, 
yeah, until today, never heard really about smart. So that seems like a really good model that we could replicate in other cities, um, at least in Europe, maybe in the States. Um, again, I think it's good that unions and co-ops, as John said, like they're springing from the same place, right? That everyone's trying to mutually trying to help each other out. Um, but I think the uh, the difficulty now is that you know we're obviously winning Uber, City Sprint, Pimlico Plumbers. We've got four other cases pending with four other career companies: Excel, Addison Lee, um, E Courier, who are nasty, nasty company, and uh, and Deliveroo. You know we're going to win them all, and then what's going to happen, right? Like I can see in a year or two, or three, like they're already doing, they are going to try and wriggle out of this, what they're going to deem as new employment um, legislation, which is, as John said, upholding existing laws. Now that they're being cornered, they're going to try and design their businesses to wriggle out of it. And I think the danger is that we are, um, companies are going to become more um, digital, more platform based. Um, and more and more casualized people and we are you know even though I'm optimistic at the moment that we're winning stuff in court I can see a time when they might be able to design their businesses where people are genuinely uh, proper freelancers properly on business at their own account and you know, it's very like dystopian reality but I can see that uh, happening and I wonder what we're going to be doing then. If, if we start losing in court, it's very hard to hold these companies to account. Um, and yeah, we'll kind of be back to the same place where we were two years ago, where no one had any hope, had to unionize, had to kind of come together um, and fight for pay rises and that conditions. So I think it's this weird kind of cyclical process but soon we're all going to be like on smartphones you know with a boss <coughs> algorithm um you know paid per task no employment rights like you might laugh about it but it's mm -hmm. it is coming i think it's absolutely true when you have people sitting on news night who are um you know private equity investor types saying this is, you know, Uber is so progressive, you know, it's going to happen in retail, it's going to happen in banking, it's so great. Like, they're, they're not lying, right? They are investing in these things already. You know, Barclays is shutting down many of its uh, stores, banks. <laughs> uh, you know, my one, my local one, they shut all the ones near me. Now we've got one left and they're only open between like three and four on a Wednesday or something. And then, you know, 12 hours a week, something like that. And it's, they just put a poster on the door saying, we now have a Barclays app if you need anything on the app. You know, and then you log into the app and it's like live chat with Alfonso from the Philippines. You know, like, <laughs> I'm just trying to explain, like, probably Alfonso will be an independent contractor with no employment rights and being paid per uh, task that he sorts out and um, he might get two pounds or, or dollars or whatever or he might get two dollars fifty and everyone will be like you know John might do more than me and I'll get annoyed because you're quicker you know but I'm saying like the, the, the model like if you're looking for the future of what the dangers of employment are um, the modern world of work, you only have to look at the career industry for the last 20 years to see exactly what will happen, how it will become monopolised, um, how people are brutally exploited and um, and the company's take it or leave it attitude is, is really hard to break down and um, if unions and co-ops can come together to build alternatives to hold them to account, then I'm all for it, and anyone who wants to help us set up a delivery co-op for London, uh, please come and talk to us. Please go there's an offer. Right. <laughs> I okay. think that's pretty much it. I'd
You okay, Max? Okay? Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Right. I'm keen to get some audience involvement. Thanks, John. Um, my name's David Ayer. I'm the media officer for United Union in Scotland. Uh, I've come down here today because um, I think there's a real opportunity for us. Um, just want to say well done to Mags, well done to Jonathan, especially in that case. It can't have been easy for you, Mags, and, and well done to you. Really interested to hear about SMART, um, and I think Mags is right. That is an interesting model that we could look at, but I think Mags is right in the sense that that's a, just a temporary model that Deliveroo and these other companies, as you said, will be trying to look at their, their legal con their, their, the way that they're set up legally in order to get around these, these judgments. And I think the technology gives us an opportunity, I think, to create platforms that are cooperative and that just bypass these folk altogether so that we don't have to have... Smart's, smart's a good idea and I think it's, a, it's an idea that we should look at, but we should be looking beyond that as well to creating, as you were saying, you know, new, new cooperative platforms um, that we can use to, to, to bypass these, these companies and that's where I think the unions can, can help and, 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 and I was really hoping I'd be able to come down here for a couple of, a couple of days and meet a lot of smart developer folk who'd be able to, to, to say, yeah, look, the possibility of creating a, a, a competitor to Uber is something that's really possible. It's a question of resources and time and then maybe I could go back to, to my union and say, look, there are possibilities here. Can we explore them and can, 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 can we try and resource them? So over the next couple of days, if folk are of that mind, if folk are developers, if folk think that is a possibility and they're interested to talk to me, please just come and grab me and we, we, can, we can talk about it. We can talk about it further. Okay. Just, uh, yeah, my name is Abigail Hunt. I'm a researcher um, on a, at the Overseas Development Institute, and I've been working um, looking at the gig economy uh, in developing countries. Um, I just had a, a question uh, for the panel, particularly our uh, UK-based panel members. Um, I just wanted, you know. Congratulations on the litigation successes. I think that's a, really a phenomenal uh, success and, and may have many more. Um, but I just wondered if you could say a few words about whether this is part of a wider strategy to improve conditions in the gig economy um, and if you see there's a political strategy involved in that as well or if, you, if litigation is your uh, main route that you think to improving conditions. Um, and as a bit of a follow-on from that, I'm really interested. Are you engaged with the government's... Um, Forgive me if I get the name wrong. I think it's a modern working practices review. Um, and I just wondered, I mean, really interested in your take on that, if you think that's a promising avenue for dialogue uh, politically um, and then, you know, kind of bouncing off the litigation successes, whether that could lead to any um, uh, legal reviews, or etc. Yeah, a couple of observations, if I may, Chris Cook. Um, and I've been corresponding with you. And, um, yeah, there's something called the cooperative advantage. It was the head of IT for the co-op actually came out with that. And what he, what he meant by that was freedom from paying returns to rent seekers. They're called shareholders, actually, or to maybe to, to bank sur surplus. So actually, you can cut costs. You cut the costs of financing if you can come up with a different financing model. That's point one. Second one, somebody I know in Berlin, Dimitri Kleiner, he believes the workers should own the means of production. He's a hardcore Marxist. You know what he calls himself? Venture communist. That's what we need here. Venture communism, comrades. Okay? Take hold of the means of production and just, it's a funding, it's a, it's a structural issue. So my interest, and it's really sad, some people collect butterflies, I collect corporate forms. Okay? So I'm interested in unconventional forms. Not, I don't see, my fundamental point, I'm going to stop and say, shareholders cannot share. To a shareholder, everybody is a cost. So we need participative corporates with different classes of member. That's how we can crack this one. So you become a member of it. It could be a courier member. It could be a management member. And that's how you crack it. And I'll shut up. Thank you. <coughs> so you started a debate here. So I'm glad, to be fair, the panel have travelled far. So I'm going to allow them to, to make some comments. Do you want to say something about, just about the... You know, the litigation side sure. of things and the wider strategy. Yeah, I think I can kind of link those two, yeah. your two responses. Um, <clears throat> the litigation has proven to be an effective tool uh, as the court cases have proven, uh, the string of court cases that we're seeing which, which side of interpretation the law is falling on here. Um, that 
uh, people are due employment rights in these sorts of precarious work as well. Um, uh, we believe that litigation is the best way to enforce employment rights as they currently stand like that. Um, however, that's not to um, that's not to cut short what we think a long view of uh, rights and protections should be. For example, those employment rights that are due to workers, as I said, are some employment rights that are due to employees, but not all. Um, for example, maternity pay and paternity pay are not paid to workers. Um, holiday pay is, but not statutory sick pay. Um, the reasons for choosing one and not the other um, is I cannot find the base or reason for it. Um, so we did submit to the we did submit a report and a suggestion to the um, Changing World of Work Review, which is hosted by Matthew Taylor, who's an advisor. Yeah. Hmm? There's a lot of reviews at the moment and inquiries. Oh, we did. We did. We did, we did, we did to this one. one. The yeah. particular review you were asking about, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. It was, she was specifically asking about the review. Well, we recommended um, that the government find a reason for, for, for example, selecting statutory holiday pay over sick pay, either find a reason or include sick pay as well, um, and also to um, put in place heavy fines for companies who are found to be bogusly employing people, self well, bogusly employing people on a self-employed basis. Um, the I forgot, lost my train of thought there. Uh, the the uh, the large fine. So we recommend that the government enforces the law, and like a, a court case like City Sprint um, for Mags was clearly a test case for people who are in similar situations. But um, the result of it is that they only get paid two days. Mags was only found to have been unlawfully deprived of two days of her holiday. So it's an extremely long process to go through in order to uh, to win this small victory. And strictly speaking, it doesn't apply to everyone. Everyone else has to engage in the same um, process at the moment. So we're asking the government to review that sort of uh, process to make it easier. Um, for example, removing tribunal fees um, for people, for low wage earners, uh, in order to pursue these sorts of things so that there's a lot more litigation that could occur. Um, yeah. Well, just to answer the TUC question as well, it's not it's not a rejection of the TUC uh, affiliation at all, but we've simply been moving at our own pace, basically. Yeah. We found that uh, we distinguished ourselves by look by unionizing people who the larger unions tended not to look at, or um, there was too small a percentage of people to, to incorporate. So we're simply moving at our own pace, and hopefully, That's some larger unions will have yeah, 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 yeah. Some uh, catch up. We should be happy to yeah. link in. To us. Yeah, I mean, that, yeah, it's not unusual yeah. for smaller unions. Yeah, because yeah, it isn't yeah. one of the bigger ones, is it? Yeah. So, can so can I just add something? Maybe you asked about a strategy there, sorry, but in, in terms of we, our community, haven't taken any litigation, so to speak, because we don't have members in this situation. Our strategy is to certainly try and provide benefits and services that are relevant to, to people, support that are relevant to people in this environment. Hence the discussion that I had earlier about the, uh, the co-working that we're working with. Um, the second part of that around policy, I think there is a role for trade unions, particularly in the administration of a new welfare system, in the very same way as the Scandinavian unions play a key part more generally, and I think that again system actually, that, um, that you could have here in the UK for self-employed freelance workers, I think would be very interesting. Mm. And I think that's something that we could probably get a coalition of trade union support around that. Uh, and it would bring us back into the mainstream because I think we have struggled with that over the last few years. Okay, I'm not going to abuse my position as chair. Well, the two statements, one about seizing the means of production and the other of could all the smart technologies turn up and show me how to build another Uber. Um, and conversations I've had in my consultancy and with some of my clients, uh, we've come back to this question a few times. And it wasn't just the technology, it isn't the technology that's made Uber Uber by, by a long way. It isn't just there for a chance for, for niggling legal requirements and stuff either. Um, there's a huge marketing budget, there's a huge sales pitch there. And I would think if you did suddenly say, hey look, I could build the Uber of my city or of my town, you still don't have to sell to your town the value of that particular thing. And if you can crack that, you've got it solved. And I, I, I really mean solve, because mm, sure. if you can crack that, if you can persuade a member of the public that you have a viable purpose, a viable 
work in doing that, what will happen? You'll get software engineers that turn up in a second. Mm. Because if they believe that what they're doing is actually worthwhile, it's actually going to happen, they'll turn up and do it. And you can build a Facebook in three days. You can build an Uber in three days. You know, you can get that done back. You really can. Uh, just very quickly, I think, to counter the previous speaker, um, and it's Ella, I work for the co-op group, and I work in the digital technology side. Um, and I think there's a huge difference between having an a early prototype of something in a hackathon and a scalable, robust, secure international mm. network system. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's just, a, like, the enthusiasm is great. And, and I think it should be there. And I think one of the things that is important is building ethics and cooperation into building technological projects. Um, but saying we can fix that in a hackathon, and you might get a prototype. Well, that's kind of like and, no, 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 so and, the, the and, problem is actually getting the, the, the cooperative's agenda product defined. Because writing code is not technically complicated. Technically, it's not. Okay, that's fine. Okay. I just wanted to ask Sarah a question, actually, which is about um, the sort of potentially unexpected um, allegiances and similarities between the um, the groups that SMART covered. Because you started with artists, right, <coughs> and then went on to uh, to other gig economy workers. And I was wondering, what sort of changes, if any, did you have to make to the existing digital platform in order to accommodate different work groups? Okay, we'll just take this lady. We'll try and keep these ones short and then we'll get okay. everybody in. I wanted to add some insight, actually, to somebody who's worked in, in the gig economy for a very long time, and also a little bit about the history. Because um, we, the, the kind of union model we have is all, has always been about employment, about seeing workers in a particular way as sort of a, a group of people working for a company. In actual fact, a lot, uh, throughout history, that's actually been fairly unusual. And there have always been people who fall outside that definition. I mean, you've mentioned artists. I'm a musician. I've worked as a peripatetic teacher for a long time. And believe me, we fall right outside that. Mm -hmm. And we have always um, found ourselves outside traditional unions outside any and outside most forms of employment protection and that's because if you look at the definition of worker we tend to mean somebody who is employed yeah. and as long as our whole approach to dealing with the, the problem of lack of protections for people in insecure employment is to try and find ways of defo defining them as employees then we are always going to have people who fall outside it for what was because there is the incentive on capitalist employers, and not just capitalists, but my biggest problem is actually schools in the public sector who have an incentive to basically make it find ways of just ensuring that you drop just outside their definition of it, the, the legal definition of employed. They have an incentive to do that, and as long as our approach as cooperators and as um, union and as unions, is to basically accept that definition mm. of worker, then we're not going to crack the problem. Exactly. We have to step outside it and say a worker is a worker regardless of the way they work. Yeah. Okay. Can I just, um, it's a different point, but I agree entirely. So we're working with John on, mm. that's what we're planning to cool. do. So I think this is absolutely key. But just a point I want to raise, and Max, you talked about the, um, the way that the, the whole Uber and deliver, all these different things work and the platforms work. I think there's, in the not too distant future, Uber aren't going to have drivers. You know, Uber's plan yeah. is to have driverless cars. We've got to start oh, thinking yeah. today mm. for what's going to happen when we've got technology that takes even those precarious workers out of the environment. What will happen to those people then? I think it's, there's a, there's a, we're, we're dealing with a danger today, which is pretty, I think, pretty scary and, and pretty horrific. Mm. We're going to come to a point in the not, next five, ten years, which is going to be even more so, and that's critical, I think. <laughs> so we'll take this last comment here and then I'm going to open it for everybody. You could pluck whatever questions yes, you feel easiest to answer. So, uh, Daniel King, Nottingham Trend. I just wanted to build on the last few comments, really, about actually is the strategy of the union about trying to protect what's going on now, or is it trying to project itself five years, ten years down the line? And maybe you can talk about sort of strike funds or war chests or whatever, and actually investing that in what might be coming, but in a Sort of, a, I don't know, there was a of venture communists, I don't know, it could be venture unions or something like that, projecting <laughs> ideas into the yeah. future about thing, what yeah. could be yeah. and maybe creating a, a cooperative alternative. Okay, right, we'll just go, so we'll just go along the yeah. table.
Uh, I'd like to make two comments. Uh, first, of course, uh, we want to, uh, if, there is, if there are alternatives to, to the liberals uh, working as platform cooperative, uh, proposing those kinds of, of services, of course, we're going to support them. Actually, at the, when, when uh, Dick Tizi fight for, for bankruptcy, there was a group of careers that wanted to to create their own cooperative, delivery cooperative, and they we, we gave them some means to, to meet and to, together and to think about their project. So of course, uh, we encourage uh, the fact that people should be separated from their own um, company. Uh, but unfortunately, they are still outside uh, the those huge platforms uh, like Deliver and so on. And uh, we want to be there to to intervene in, into this uh, relation between the worker and the, and the platform. Um, then the second question, I want to be sure that I got it right. Um, so it is the shift between our historical public and uh, the larger yeah. workers, um, public that we are now reaching. Uh, and how, what technical changes we had to do with our... If with any, or uh, well, okay. what sort of basically, because you know, from the software development project, right, like your sort of MVP is the, the offer, or the minimum viable product is the offer that you have to the artists. What happened then when you scaled out into different user okay. groups? Well, actually, n nothing. <laughs> well, yeah. uh, our, how we worked is that we, we, propose something and we check how it works and it actually works out and we make some some changes along the way but we don't block things until we think okay we got it right let's go now and it takes some years and so we we actually step into uh, these evolutions and all that uh, social experiments uh, so we, for our tools if you check right now our website and our our tools uh, which is an online tool that the user can, well, the member can use to to declare the, the days they're going to work and to invoice. That's a, that's it. It's not a, a platform that allows them to to connect, uh, unfortunately, with one another. Uh, but if you check uh, now, you can see the evolutions, uh, and we're trying to fix things bit by bit uh, so it can fit the reality of uh, every career. Uh, or every every member. I just want to add just one more thing. In the case of Koreas, we had a, one technical big technical problem is that there was a huge member, a number of, of Koreas, and uh, they had to go online and say, okay, I'm going to work that day, and I'm going to invoice that day afterwards uh, to say, okay, I, I, I shifted three hours and a half, I have to invoice that much, and I don't really remember, blah, blah, blah. So there were a lot of mistakes, and there were people outside working uh, but being under no working contract, be working black actually, because they didn't fill in those administrative things on our platform. And so we developed uh, an API that is uh, linked to, uh, to a, a scheduling uh, platform that the career can fill in, and it generates automatically a contract within our system, and uh, so it is automized in, a, in some way for that kind of public that has that it's really flexible uh, and on de works in an on-demand uh, economy. So it's just like, okay, I'm gonna shift to, in, three, in 15 minutes, I'm gonna get online and it generates automatically a, a contract. Okay, thank you. Well, Danny, just want you to do this question. Um, yeah, I could maybe just touch upon the point, the, the, the type of workers that fall outside the employment box. Um, that's kind of, how the IWGB got going properly is actually is, is by, as I said before, uh, organizing people who the larger unions didn't tend to look at as much. And that involved looking at people who were self-employed or considered self-employed. And it involved us having to question kind of what the face value of the thing was, whether these people are actually not due their employment rights or whether they are. Um, I'll give you just one example of one sector that we're working on now, and that is foster carers. Um, uh, we recently, in September last year, we had a meeting in PGB. Um, they, in our, they work for agencies with, who are either private, in the private or public sector, um, and are considered self-employed. Uh, these people 
foster carers are people who professionally take uh, children of the state into their home or troubled people and look after them. Um, however, the amount that they're paid is a pittance and often raises serious issues with minimum wage regulations, etc., etc. But um, because of their employment status um, and because of, unfortunately, some uh, uh, case law which uh, is stacked against them, um, that they are not actually operating under a contract of employment. They're rather operating under statute. There's actually no employment, it's just an agreement, um, which is a totally con it's contrary to reason um, that there wouldn't be a contract in any sort of employment arrangement. Um, so in this case, litigation doesn't actually, uh, litigation seems like a bit of a dead end or, or a stuff or a traffic jam here because we've got case law already proving the contract. So the way that we're taking this is that we're getting MPs on board to form an all-party parliamentary group. Um, and it's as simple as getting enough, parliament, uh, enough, enough members of parliament on board to raise, and raise uh, to propose a bill or propose an amendment to a currently tabled bill. Um, something as simple as an addition that uh, foster care should be accorded workers' rights and perhaps a few, you know, a few subsections tailoring it to their role. Um, we're optimistic that that's going to help change things and then enable unions to be able to then provide more services um, to foster carers. If they then have rights, then we can obviously protect them and fight for them a lot better. So there's various options, not just litigation, not just on the streets protests, but um, there's various options. And going forward with that, you know, we need to have some uh, a solution that replaces the, the void that we create. It places the agencies, more to the point. Yeah. Why don't you just take over the agencies? That, well, that's yeah. venture communism, comrade. Yeah. 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 <laughs> can I just, can I just right. push back just a little bit on that one? Because <laughs> I know the problem, it seems to me, in the gig economy is where you've got what you might call monopsony power. Um, and what do you do about where you've got kind of monolithic em entities that effectively control the ability, the, the, the control the ability of workers to sell their labour? Um, you know, when you've got a single buyer, or, or, or uh, effectively a single buyer, who, uh, a buyer who controls what goes on in that area, then you have then those workers inevitably have very little power. So sort of part of what you need to do is to try and break that power. Okay, we'll try and continue. To, oh, get bring you in, Max. I'm, I'm conscious. I'm keeping yeah, everybody waiting. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to say that, like, um, the, current, the international career community is is like a big family, and I have a lot of friends in the EU and in the states that um, do work for co-ops, career co-ops. A fantastic one in New York City called Samurai. They use a phone. Yeah, they just give a phone number to their clients. They don't have technology. They just call each other, being like, go and do this job, go and do this job, yeah? And they make good money, they're competitive with all the other big companies. Um, and in Zurich, a fantastic co-op set up in the 70s, they work because they monopolize the city, yeah? And that's, that's one of my concerns, it's like, if we start a co-op in the gig economy sort of thing, you have to be a monopoly, right? Because your costs are so tiny, the margins are so slim between the competitors that ultimately we are going to be the most brutal capitalist enterprise of all time. <laughs> bit, bit of a concern there. Um, and I would like to talk to you about the situation in schools afterwards because yes. uh, I, I have a friend in a similar situation. Yes, it's a real issue. And I think uh, the changing nature of law will help you. So, should we? Okay, um, I'll, I'll just finish with Michael's remarks and say that the, the, one thing was the, the, the technical side of things and uh, the platforms that are there. The community, we are working on a couple of platforms just now, one to help our activists in terms of what they do and the information that they provide and help them organise and recruit. Probably the more interesting one is to try and provide a corporate platform for people who are underemployed, matching them up with employers and things, whatever. So we, we do quite a bit of work in that area. And it's, 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 for all these things, um, I think it's, uh, it's getting into the right place and um, making sure that it's going to make a difference. So, you know, I think when it comes to trade unions taking decisions, I think we're all very conscious that it's members' money uh, and that's always focused um, very much in our discussions about investing for the future. Uh, and I think that is, we are inherently conservative when it comes to, to, to spending money. That's a good thing, uh, but also means that sometimes we're a little bit slow to, to respond to that.
Um, but I think this agenda is so important, it's clear today, there's a lot of people with enthusiasm, a lot of good work happening on the ground. Um, I'd really like to say thank you to you, Sarah, for travelling the furthest to come and see us the first time in London as well, <laughs> but not your last. And um, I have to come down every week to Scotland, but I get to go home to a nice place every week. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you for all coming. I think this has been a really interesting discussion. Hope you enjoy the, the rest of the day and tomorrow. Here and just thank all our speakers. Yeah.